story of David and Goliath is familiar to many of us. It's a long uh, story, so I'll be breaking it up. It comes from the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. But it's, again, it's in this series that hope is here. And the first week we talked about how we, we, we face you know, despair and we get worn down by things like water pumps that go out in our house. And how God helps us when we feel burdened. And others help carry those burdens. Last week we talked about how we find forgiveness in the cross of Jesus Christ. Today we celebrate communion. And when we find forgiveness, we find we're able to forgive others. Today, I'm going to talk about the hope that's given to us when we feel like we're facing more than we can handle. Movies, there's, Dave likes talking about the different movies coming out. There's a pattern to certain movies. Football season, especially when I see Notre Dame on TV, I always think of the movie Rudy, Rocky, Cinderella Man, Cool Runnings. There are all these stories about people or a person facing these insurmountable odds. It doesn't seem possible they're going to be able to make way through it. We all like these stories of people overcoming great difficulties. I think mainly because we all at some level knows what it feels like to face overwhelming situations in our lives. When we feel like we cannot overcome things on our own. We cheer for the underdog because somehow we feel like if they can win, if Rudy can do it, if Rocky can knock that guy out, then so can we win. Life can be full of challenging situations. Whether it's parenting children in today's world, helping to raise grandchildren, just triggering out the schooling can be so stressful. Jobs. You know, I think of people who've lost jobs, whether it's because of the COVID or because of natural disasters, they wipe out their homes, everything they have. And we try to grow in our faith and Stop doing some of the bad habits that we have. All these things can give us a sense of being overwhelmed. And maybe that is because things like this are not meant to be done on our own. The Bible is full of stories of different characters who against all odds, they experience victory. And there's a common thread that runs through all these stories of people that faced overwhelming odds and, and came through. It's those people who were fully aware that without God on their side, there's no hope for a favorable outcome. Left to themselves, they would be defeated. They would face defeat of some kind. And one of the classics is David. That's why we're going to look at the story of David and Goliath. Now this takes place long before David's king of Israel. At this point, he's just a young man, a, a boy. I'll begin with uh, verses 20 and 21 of the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. So David got up early in the morning, left the flock with a keeper, picked up the provisions, and went just as Jesse, his father, had directed him. And he came to the encampment as the army was going out in battle formation, shouting the battle cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle formation, army against army. So right before David arrives, he's in the field with the flock. He's a shepherd boy. And he, his father had given him directions. Hey, take some provisions to your brothers who are they're serving in this Israel army. He gets there and they're getting ready for battle, these two huge armies. He gets to watch this. It's a shift from the what he knew into what he did not know. And the truth is we are hardly ever prepared to handle what life throws at us. Whether it's something in our house breaks that seems to be happen a lot. When we least needed to. We get a phone call with a diagnosis. Maybe it's a temptation of something we didn't see coming. 
No one wants to be in that position where there's no clear way ahead, nowhere clear to path to victory. It's not black and white. That's where David is. He finds himself in his first few verses and might be where you are at today. When we find ourselves in that kind of situation, in that place, we need some kind of hope. The past year has been very painful for many, if not all of us. I lost my father last November. Even though he was going downhill, it still hits you. Many of you have lost friends or family members. And something as a pastor that I've come to understand is that people often die unexpectedly. And when that someone's a close family member or a friend, we often get lost and disoriented. Again, I mentioned people have lost homes because of natural disasters, jobs through no fault of their own. And when something like that happens, something that we weren't expecting, that's when we have to decide how we're going to proceed. How are we going to move forward? Do we just give up? Well, whatever happens, happens. It's out of my control. Or do we trust God to give us the strength to go on? David arrives at the front lines to check on his brothers. And it's at that point he gets the first look at the, the armies. And we continue with verse 23. As he was talking with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines. And he spoke these same words again and again. David heard him. When the men of Israel all saw the man, they fled from him and were very frightened. The men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel. The king will reward the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter in marriage and make his father's family free from taxes and service in Israel. Then David spoke to the man, to the men who were standing by him. What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes the disgrace of his taunting from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised circumcised Philistine that he was that he has taunted and defied the armies of the living God? Continue at verse 32 to 37. David said to Saul, Let no man's courage fail because of Goliath. Your servant will go out and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for you are only a young man, and he has been a warrior since his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock. I went out after it and attacked it and rescued the lamb out of its mouth. And when it rose up against me, I seized it by its whiskers and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted and defiled the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, may the Lord be with you. I can hear when I, I read those verses how determined David was. Even though he's just a young man, he knows someone has to stand up to this guy, this threat. Even though Goliath was this decorated warrior, he struck fear into all those people in Israel's army. He was a giant. No one was willing to take him on. There was someone has to do something, and David is willing to take that on. What causes a young boy, an underdog, to take on such a momentous task seems totally unwinnable. 
Hope. Hope. Hope that he is not going to fight the battle alone. Hope that with God's help, there's nothing that is impossible. Hope that whatever little he has to offer is going to be enough. And David's reasoning for this hope comes from God's faithfulness in the past. He, he looked back to how God has been with him before. David knew God was with him when he was protecting those sheep in the field and he had to defeat a lion and a bear. Surely God was going to protect him now too. When we find ourselves in seasons of struggles, sometimes we have to remind ourselves of how God has been with us in the past. When we believe that something or someone is trustworthy, it gives us hope. We need to understand that hope is a der derivative of of trust. Hope is a derivative of trust. A good way to look at trust is if you've been to a public pool or maybe a private pool party where you have multi-generations and there's usually a little toddler, mom or dad or sometimes both are in the, the water swimming, the deep water, and the little one's just jumping right in he knows his parents are going to catch him. He trusts that that person is going to save him. There's no fear. There's no concern. There's only trust in the father or the mother to catch them, as they have in the past. They caught me before, they're going to catch me again. They're hopeful that even though they're going to splash into that water, they're going to be lifted up and kept from going under. David's confidence comes from God's faithfulness. And it's the drive that he needs to overcome. And we'll continue with verses 40 to 47, I believe. Then he took his shepherd's staff in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones out of the stream bed and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had, that is, in his shepherd's pouch. With his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. The Philistine came and approached David with his shield bare in front of him. When the Philistine looked around and saw David, he derided and disparaged him because he was just a young man. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with shepherd's staffs? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the corpses of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that this entire assembly may, may know that the Lord does not save with the sword or with the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will hand you over to me. Saul, who was the king at the time, he tries to give David his armor and his sword, and David, it's too heavy, he can't move, he can't barely lift the sword. So here's David, this young boy, going against Goliath, this fearsome warrior with just five smooth stones. And after Goliath threatens him, David responds by telling him that, hey, you're fighting with sword and spear and javelin, but I'm letting God fight my battles for me. Maybe you don't feel equipped 
to overcome the things that you're facing. You're in good company. Maybe you know that your trial is too much for you. It's a good place to start. Here's what we have to remember. It's only when we realize that the battle is too much for us and they're not really waged in conventional ways, but rather in the spirit that we'll begin to experience God fighting for us. For David, this is a spiritual battle and it takes God's involvement to experience a victory. And that's why I chose this as a memory verse. Paul talks about this in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, verse 12. He wrote, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You know, God, through the Apostle Paul, is reminding us that our battles are not really about the physical, what's going on around us physically in the world. And if they're not about the physical things, then we can't overcome them physically. It takes a spiritual approach. We fight our battles by submitting to the will of God first. We fight our most difficult situations and circumstances by bringing them to God in prayer. We fight the evil that we come against, that we encounter by inviting God to intervene on our behalf. David calls on God as he engages Goliath in battle. And with that single stone, a precise throw, and the power of God, David's shot flies straight and true and hits Goliath right in the forehead, we learn. He drops down to the ground. He's killed. That single victory turns the tide of that entire war. The Philistines run, and the Israelites pursue them. Verses 51 and 52. So he ran and stood over the Philistine, grasped his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their mighty champion was dead, they fled. The men of Israel and Judah stood with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance to the valley and the gates of Ekron, and the fatally wounded Philistines fell along the way to Sharedman, even as far as Gath and Ekron. Suddenly, this once frightened Israelite army is emboldened, emboldened by David and his sling. Because of David's bravery and trust in God, they're all given hope. That they too can be part of this victory, this triumph through God, because of God. We have to understand that hope is contagious. David's hope in God spreads like wildfire. The entire story changes. The narrative takes a new tone. It's no longer about defeat. It's about victory, victory in God. There's something that happens when you have a fellowship of faith when just one person has the audacity to believe God to do great things. God is going to do great things here. It begins with one person in the, the body of Christ who believes that God can use them and lift others up. It takes one person with a heart for overseas mission to help support those in the world who need it. It takes one person who believes that prayer changes things. It could be a spark that ignites the whole congregation, the whole body of Christ to hope. That person could be you. 
Even though we cannot see how God might come through, faith is believing that it's still possible. There's no enemy that you can face in this life that God cannot give you victory over. But you must trust in Him. When the church comes together in great faith, there's nothing it cannot do. The Israelites back then, they were fearful and afraid until David stepped up in faith. Sometimes a community of faithful people just needs one person to go first. That step of faith can ignite other people to follow. When a church begins to function in this way, that's when the community that this church, that body is a part of, becomes part of God's kingdom, living out its mission. A foundation of our hope is how God has acted in our lives before. Our hope, our faith is a hope-filled faith based on a relationship with Jesus. May your hope continue to grow based on your experience of God acting in your life. Amen. Thank you.